To go from one enemy to multiple enemies requires us to simply construct an array of enemies and then we will iterate through that the same as we did in the catcher game with the drops. We say enemy, square braces, not curly, square braces to indicate it's an array, and we'll just call it enemies. Now we get to populate that. Now one thing I'm going to do with this is I'm going to deactivate the original enemy that we had going, but we're going to be using similar code with it, but we just want the one enemy, or the group of enemies. So now to add in multiple enemies into our project, what we can do is go enemies is equal to, and we're going to then cycle through using a for loop. So first, first we have to then set how big it's going to be. So we say it's a, a new enemy and we'll just put in 10 right now as our starting part. So now we use a for loop and if there's j right there then we will use k right here because we don't want to repeat iterators. Uh, it's often not the end of the world but it's not a bad practice to get into. And now at this point, if I were to just say 10 because that's how many are there, that's good. Except that if I change how many enemies I want, so say I wanted 100 enemies all of a sudden, I would have to remember to change it here and anywhere else I'm referring to it. So the easier way to reference this would be enemies.length. So now I reference it there. And there will be times periodically in videos where I will have a hard-coded number in there and it comes back to uh, bite me that I can't remember. I'm like, why am I having issues with my code? And that would be why. So we, once we set the value here, just like we did in the drops, then we need to refer to how many we're referring to by the length of this array. Now we'll set each individual one equal to a new enemy. Just like that. That's it. So we get to then repeat this for loop down here, but instead of telling a single enemy to chase, update, and display, now I am going to say dot chase, and then we tell it who, and we ch pass into it players x and y values. Now we tell enemies square brackets k to update and finally we tell it to display. So this now makes our array of enemies chase and if we run we can see that they're now chasing after me as long as they are within range. So we can try and divide the forces here. Spread, whoa, that guy's close. Spread them out. And the good part about this is that now if I change this up, we won't do 100 because it will get really ugly, but even 50. I can, wow, that's um, brutal. So if I'm going to do something like that, we probably want to try and set up a little more um, variety in the speeds here. So with that, we're able to add in multiple enemies, not one, not two, 50, 100, however many we want to complete our project. The red code at the bottom seems to be that processing had a little glitch somewhere, but it's not going to impact things dramatically. So to continue working on our keyboard controlled animated sprites, we never implemented our intersection using rectangles. So we worked out how to do it. So we studied it where we figure out the distance apart on the X and Y axis. We use our half width, half height values as well to decide when those objects are intersecting. So the good part is now that we've done the heavy lifting of the code, we can just take this entire function that we have here, 
I'm going to copy that. And now I'm going to be done with my rectangle intersect. And we'll go into my keyboard project and I can just paste this in. I can put it above or below the keyboard. and we'll just paste it in. So now currently if I look here it's telling me I'm trying to do an intersect and it underlines it in red because with this method that means it would be expecting a class object called sprite and a class object called enemy. If I look up at the top here I can see I have enemy but I do not have sprite I have player. So an easy fix is to change that to player. So I have player and enemy as I put that in and then that gives me what I need to make that happen. So that's all we have to do for that portion of it and then the next portion is to go into our draw and where we are cycling through all of the enemies here this is where we can figure out hey has some version of intersection happened and if so we can provide some version of display or something else to do it. So what I'm going to do right now so we can see when it's happening I will just simply say if so if rectangle intersect and I'll pass in the player and the current enemy that we're looking at here. So this is in the loop where we're cycling through during the draw function, cycling through all of the enemies. And I will just grab the current enemy I'm working with. Now this loop has an iterator of K on it. Uh, I believe because we copied that from the um, beginning part in the code. So that was, we just grabbed the loop here. So we had player, then we had the enemies here. So because this loop used K and I just copy pasted it over, that's why we did it. Generally within this function here of setup, we normally, if we're going to do a bunch of for loops, each one we use a different iterator, I, J, K, so that we don't have to worry about any type of kind of variable collision where it would somehow be grabbing the wrong one. Processing is pretty good about it. Some languages are not so a good practice is just to use different iterators. And the iterator is this little variable we make that we set while we're going through this loop. So now I'm just going to turn the screen red and I'll do a you know, a faint red, a transparent red. So I set the transparency at uh, 50 out of 255. And then I'm just going to draw a rectangle the full width and height of the screen. So if intersect happens, it's going to start turning red. So now as I work through here, I can see the, the more unicorns that are on top of me redder and redder here we'll try and get all of them there so it gets redder and redder and redder so now I move over here we'll pull a few away from the herd so we can see okay that one so we'll pull a few more so we just kind of keep separating them so we don't have them all so we can see how that intersect is happening now to make it easier to see, I am going to turn back on the rectangles for our object. So the enemy will have a green rectangle and we'll set it at 100. The player, let's go into the player display here, we'll turn back on its rectangle and this one uh, we'll give it a yellow so it's different than what's currently there. So now when I look at this, I can see that rectangle and we can see immediately, let's just try and isolate it so we only have one unicorn chasing me. There we go, now we got one. So we can see the moment it goes in the rectangles overlap, it becomes 
that. So looking at this, it does seem that we could probably shrink the player's rectangle a little bit and even the unicorn. We could even make the area of influence just the body or just the head and the body and not the legs. So we could shrink it up a little bit uh, to make the bounding box of intersection a little bit tighter. But we can see how that intersect is indeed working for our purposes here. So that's good. With the intersection taken care of, the next thing I want to do is add in a projectile. So this projectile allows me to be able to have something to shoot. So I want to make this, this is the player's projectile. So we're setting this up that the player can shoot, the enemies can't. Now, when we say shooting, I mean, you can think about it doesn't necessarily have to be violent. It doesn't have to be bullets or missiles or laser beams that we're shooting, but we do have, you know, options. Anytime we make something that is visual and animated and interactive like this, how we skin it creates the experience. So it doesn't, when we say shooting, it doesn't have to be violent in what we're doing. It can certainly be, I mean, we could be sending out flowers or hearts or kisses or puppy dogs. So don't always assume that if we're doing things like this, it has to then be a violent solution. And I'm just prepping this. It's always a good habit to make sure I have those comments in. Now we're going to have x, y with height, and then I will have vx, vy, and I'm also going to want to store my starting x and y positions. Now the projectile is going to be a little bit different than a standard object because it's going to be parked until we want to use it. So this means we need to have a way to track is it in motion or not and anytime we have something that has two possible values it is a boolean. So now I have my projectile and when we work with the projectile I want to when I create the instance of it I'm going to pass in a, uh, a starting x and a starting y position, so those will be floats to match the x and y that I have up there. And then it will be, um, so my starting x is going to be equal to sx, my starting y is going to be equal to sy, and it may be the starting X and Y we want off screen or we want it on screen so we have visual representation. Again, it's based on how you want to set up your gaming interactive structure. And then we set our initial X and Y equal to that as well. We could set them equal to starting X and starting Y, so we could, but it doesn't really matter. And then we get to establish our width and our height. So right now we can just make a simple little square projectile. And we may later on want to make it rectangular so it shows different um, orientations based on the direction. Because we are going to be able to fire up, down, left, or right. So if we have a rectangular object, and We'll just be using a simple rectangle for our object now, but you may want to use a graphic or image that you set up instead. So now Vx will also be 0, Vy is going to be equal to 0, and in motion, while the bullets or projectiles don't start out in motion, they are parked. So we'll set that equal to false. Now Command or Control T, that does my formatting. I forgot it doesn't help me out um, around my equal signs if I'm lazy that way and I, I want it to look a little bit better. 
there that looks better and that's cleaner so that sets up my initial methods now this is a visual object therefore it's going to have an update well, down too far right here void display so we're going to have those same methods that we have worked with previously and much like the drops in the catcher game we needed a way to reset them so we didn't have to repeat code and we're going to have a check bounds method as well same as what we've done prior so some of these and we'll also need a fire method because the projectile when it's fired we want to just call a fire method and then the projectile takes care of its business so let's populate some of these things first with stuff that is repeating what we've worked on inside the catcher game so we have certain uh, methods so if we go back and look at one of the you know original catcher games so this is after we added uh, sound into it we can go into the drop so drop had a reset um, it didn't uh, check its it didn't have a check bounds on it it was just doing that right here because it was only moving across one axis so uh, the easy way to write or check bounds is going to simply be so if x is less than zero or x is greater than the width and we may have to temper a few of these because yeah, we want it to go totally off screen before it happens so if x is greater than the width we're registering from the top left corner of whatever object we're working on so at zero that means its left edge has hit the edge of the screen if we want to wait till it's all the way off of the screen then we could just simply use a negative w value the width of the object that would work as well so we care about our horizontal movements x to negative w and x greater than width but we also have our y will be less than negative h or zero if you don't want to be as precise and when y is greater than the height of the sketch so when any one of those four options has occurred a couple curly braces a barrow when that has happened then we just call the reset method so that's easy enough to integrate into it for our check bounds so then that works out okay and update well it's going to have to do some other stuff inside of update it's also going to need to call check bounds and just like if we look at player see we had this set up because this one doesn't just call a single each one had a different value because we're doing the uh, asteroid game style wrapping on it but now if I look under my update common thing we're going to um, oh here we go not there oh that's doing some other stuff that I forgot I I updated a few things in the code since we we're last here so we'll take a look at that as well um, that I didn't put those on the video but the key thing is under update we add in the VX and the VY like that so under update X plus equals VX y plus equals b y so that takes care of those so now we have to think about what's going to happen inside of reset and what i want to have happen there is i want our projectiles to go back to their starting x and to their starting y 
Now under display, I'm going to set a fill color. No, oh, that's not, there we go. There's fill color. And then, uh, wow, typing is disagreeing with me today. And then we draw a rect from x, comma, y, comma, width, comma, height. So it now draws a rect where we want it. So right now, we have a start for the projectiles, but we haven't uh, made it work yet. So projectiles, and I say plural because we're going to want more than once. We're going to have a pool of projectiles that we can work with. Not an unlimited supply, and we'll generally figure out how many we need through trial and error, but usually it's somewhere between you know, 5 to 10 that we're going to end up working with as part of this. So... We could go and draw the projectiles on screen, but we don't have any way to get them in motion yet. That's where we are going to want to be able to fire them. So, so to fire a projectile, this is where we need to pass in a starting position. And that starting position is going to be where the player is. So when we choose to fire, we're going to say, I want to start the projectile on the player. And then once we do that, then we say x is equal to new x, y is equal to new y. And at this point, what we can verify is if we're not in motion. So remembering that in motion is a Boolean. So when we use the exclamation mark, we're saying the negatives. And that's the equivalent to saying in motion is equal to false. So if in motion is false, and that's again what using that exclamation point does for us. I'm just going to put a comment here and we're getting enough uh, curly braces and nested curly braces. It's not a bad idea to put some of these ends in like this as comments. So when we start adding in additional lines of code, I don't accidentally put some Thing in something else because I'm sure you've all experienced where you get the you know unexpected void thing or you try and format it it gives you a bonus curly brace you're like I didn't type that why did that just appear and it's because you start you missed a closing curly somewhere so that's why I always get in the habit of adding your closing curlies right away at the beginning so that you know what to do now with this we need to provide one other piece of information. We need to know what direction the player is standing so then when we fire our projectile can go in that motion because otherwise what do we set the VX and the VY to? We don't know. So we, we need to know what direction the player is going to be facing. Now if I go into the player class right and if I look at the player class, well, I, I did add in um, something to limit it so when I move diagonally, it doesn't go too fast. So I'll explain um, what this is instead of using the VXVY uh, a little bit later. So I mean, we can get rid of it and go back to the original, and it's going to work just fine with it. Um, I run this so we can see but now what happens is when I'm going diagonally I'm effectively going at double speed versus single so when I go diagonal if I hold down two keys it goes really fast and what we can do with that alright I'm gonna go into it now just so it's here if you wanted 
put this in you can if you don't you don't have to and I'm using what's called a vector now a vector is essentially um, a way to store two values now vectors when they're used for um, kind of velocities and for positioning and everything else they always have two values unless it's a three-dimensional vector then it would have three so when I make this vector the vector will have two items in it so that vector so we set the vector V as a new vector and I set its X as speed X its Y as speed Y so I'm able to populate that so if I were to print out that vector so V looks like so it looks like um, so it would look like um, speed x comma speed y. So it's a way to store two values. But it can also, beyond storing x and y location, we use it to store the angle that I'm moving and the velocity I'm moving along that angle. So it, it really becomes a matter of it starts to move into the realm of dealing with trigonometry and moving along diagonals. This is where vectors really shine. And what I'm able to do is to now take that vector value that I have and I can do what's called normalize it where I essentially take the magnitude of that vector and scale it down to a fraction of 0 to 1 and then multiply it by my max speed. So that means when I'm moving, I can only move at my maximum velocity, whether I'm going horizontal, diagonal, or uh, vertical. So uh, if you want to get into working with vectors, a really good resource beyond the help documents is a book called The Nature of Code by Daniel Schiffman. So there happens to be Daniel Schiffman and he has written a couple books on processing and is a uh, professor um, okay, I'm drawing a blank to where but he's great and runs his own YouTube channel so if I wanted to go into here and go look up vectors I can read about vectors so vectors store location information they store or uh, directional, so angle and kind of magnitude or speed that you're moving along that angle. So they're a really powerful way of working through a two or three dimensional coordinate space. Here's all the methods that are built into the P vector class. And his book, and you can see you, you can donate to it, um, but you can also just read the entire book online as a series of web pages so the whole book is online or you can go and buy the book from him as a downloadable PDF I do recommend it it's a phenomenal book it's written in processing but uh, the concepts apply to working with uh, vectors and particles and all kinds of super cool stuff in other uh, languages so the concepts are the concepts but the code as it's presented is written in processing which is really cool so if you want to learn about vectors then we can go into it and study it in much greater detail so you can go and copy the code you can put the code into your own sketches and play with it and start to understand it so vectors are really about being able to tell us how to get from point A to point B in this case it'd be 15 steps left West, three steps north to do that transition. So vectors kind of help us to work with that. And if you've ever played with trigonometry, you understand where you can use sines and cosines and angles and move along those things as well. So if we were to do a project where we were rotating our objects and then moving along diagonal vectors, we could do it simply using sine and cosine computations but if we use vectors it just becomes so much easier so if you want to learn all about vectors and how they integrate with programming code I cannot recommend the nature of code strong enough it's a great book 
uh, Daniel Schiffman is a phenomenal uh, lecturer, super positive and enthusiastic. So definitely go check it out if you are interested in that sort of thing. All right, so back into our code. So that's, uh, then I add in the X component of the vector, the Y component of the vector get added in, but this now locks the speed of my player. Uh, we have a couple other bonuses on the enemy. We'll look at it at the very end where the enemy is updated so it doesn't move in the jittery diagonal but stair steps it. So we'll take a look at that in a little bit. But back to our projectile. So what we want to do is you know, figure out what direction we need to move. So I'm going to create a value and we'll call it facing right now. Now I need to store this so when we uh, fire it we now can keep track of it. So now we have that facing value and we get to then use that inside our code here. So if we're not in motion then when we fire, we want to go into motion. So I could use an if, else if statement or a switch. I'm going to use a switch here because this is one of those times where, oh, I've got to write switch, SWI. Uh, there we go, that looks better. It's not red and underlined and screaming at me. So we'll be passing in one of four values and when I do this so if I'm going left we'll set my VX equal to and this is where we probably uh, I, I could hard code this in right now but I'm realizing I probably want a max speed or just a speed value that I'm working with here and set that up as one of the um, variables for my object. So I'm going to go back up into my properties and we'll set speed. Speed is equal to 10. And the reason I'm doing that is if I decide I want my projectiles to go faster or slower, I can just change the number once here. Otherwise, I will have to change the number four times. Um, as I work my way through. Now, do you remember that when we do switch statements, after each case, at the end of the case, we have to put in a break, because otherwise, if this one is true and the next one is true, then it will move, or if this one is true and there's no break, it goes on and will execute the next one as well. So, this that's the real kind of gotcha of working with switch statements, is remembering that you do have to put in that break. So now Vx is going to be equal to 10 when we move to the right. Vy will still be equal to 0. Break. And then my case of up. Now when I go up, my Vx is going to be equal to 0, but my Vy is going to be, oh, not, I didn't want to, 10. Vy is going to be equal to negative speed. I just went and made the variable and forgot to put that in. Speed and speed. Now let's go back and add that break. And then finally, my case for going down is going to be Vx, of course, will be zero because we're not moving horizontal, but my Vy is going to be equal to a positive speed value because remembering zero is up top, the height is down at the bottom, so we want it to go to a bigger number as we work our way down. That was a hard end switch to type there. So, when we fire, if we're not in motion, then we want this to happen. And if we've fired, we want to now set in motion equal to true. So now that sets it equal to true as part of it. So if we're not in motion, we set in motion equal to true and then we start motoring and make something happen. Okay, so 
got some of her projectile in here. We're going to have to come back and certainly do more. Now, player, when I look at the player, player, well, it has offsets that happen. You know, so if I press left, my offset is 9. So we're setting offsets that we need here, but we're, we're not storing a facing value. So we could do kind of a lookup. So we could use that offset value. So, I mean, we could, I guess, in the projectile, instead of using these strings, we could use the offset values. Personally, I find it's much easier to remember words than numbers of what number goes to what. I have to go and look at my sprites to figure out which number corresponds. So with the player, I'm going to go in and create a string to store what direction the player is facing. And we can just simply call it facing. Now the player, when it starts out, I want the player to be facing down. And that also, let's see, let me go look in the offset. Offset, when I'm going down, my offset is 6. So originally when it started out, the player was facing up. The offset was 0. So I'm going to, well, not delay, change my offset to 6 up here. Pretty minor, it just happens to match the sequence of my sprites. Your sprites may be at a different angle, so or um, orientation, so that's going to be different for you. So now I'm facing down, and now let's go and put this in on the update. So facing will be equal to, and if I press left, it is going to be left. And if I press right, facing is going to be equal to right. And if I press up, course it will be a standard easy up and if I press down facing is going to be equal to down. Alright so now we know what direction that the player is facing so when I fire I'm going to be able to work with that on my projectile. So we've done a bunch of work here. Our work's not done in projectile but we're off to a good start and now we need to add a projectile or projectiles into our main class. So it's now time to add in some projectiles. Now to do that we also need to be able to um, register another keystroke. So I'm going to just put all of our new variables down here. So even though I could add it on up top I'm going to use space as the key that we fire with, so we'll have to add that into our um, key press, key release options that we have. I'm going to make an array to hold my projectiles. And I need to, well, semicolon. I also We'll need to be able to figure out what my next projectile is going to be. It's not unlike using current frame and being able to cycle through our frames. We're going to have our array of projectiles that we work with and we'll need to be able to reference all of those. So let's see, this is my end setup. So new stuff. I'll put everything down here so it's easy to find. Space will be equal to false, and then we need to now populate our projectiles here. To do that, so projectiles is going to be equal to a new projectile, and we can decide how many we want to start with. I'm just going to start out with five. I'll see how that works, and then we can move forward from there. So we going back to iterators again, I, J, the next letter in the alphabet will be K. And K is going to be less than projectiles.length. Now 
I look up here, I created my enemies, and then I said k is less than 10. What we really should do is use enemies.length up here as well, because otherwise that will come back to bite us uh, a little bit later in the code, and I will show you where that is as we get there. Oh, k plus plus. So many for loops use i that by default my fingers automatically type i when I'm doing a for loop. So projectiles k is going to be a new pro oh, miss my n new projectile, and we need to give it a starting position. So I'm going to line my projectiles up along the bottom of the screen so that we can see them. And in doing so, then we'll be able to see when we're using them. Now, I would probably say in your finished projects, we want to move them off screen. But right now, the same way that when we collide with the enemy or the projectile hits an enemy, we'll probably just stick the enemy off to the corners of the screen as well. This way, we can verify that our code is indeed working. So I'll just choose 150 in from the left corner. And then we'll add in um, our iterator multiplied by 50. So we'll space our projectiles out by 50. And our whole thing is 600 tall. So if I went at the bottom, 550 should be a decent amount. So this now creates the projectiles that I am working with. Next, not new, projectile. It's going to be equal to 0 because starting out, we're referencing the position in the array. So next projectile gets to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So we're always grabbing that next one off of the list. Now we have space here. Let's go down in our key press. We're going to add in one more case as part of this. So I can say case and space has a key code of 32. And for that, it will be space is equal to true break. So again, if you want to know what the key codes are, we'll use our little thing that we did up here, which then displayed the current key code on screen with that string. So we certainly can do that. Um, or you can go look up an ASCII key code chart and find out your key codes and work with it that way. So under my key press, key release, I've just now added in for the space, so we can now work with that space. This brings us to the fun part. So now we get to tell those projectiles to shoot. So I'm going to put that up at the top. Right after clearing the background, we'll put in our shooting right up here. So to do that, we do if space Meaning we press the space bar, curlies, returns, up arrow, there we go. So, what we want to do is to tell the next projectile to fire, and then we can set next projectile to a new number. So we tell projectiles, next projectile dot fire. And we need to tell it where. And we can send in the player's x, send in the player's y. Now, if we we're using a vector, we could just you know, reference that vector. So p dot v, if we had a vector for the player. Oh, we do, but we'll keep it with x and y's right now. And then we want to send in facing. So we've now sent in that value. Then we need to update next projectile. So next projectile is going to be equal to next projectile plus one, and then we'll use our little modulus operation and divided by projectiles dot length. Again, using projectiles dot length, so it's based on how big that projectile array is, is going to be much better because down here where I'm referring to 10 on the enemies. If I go up and change and decide I want to create 15 enemies and only have 10 referenced down here, I'm going to have 5 floating around on screen. 
that don't show up but then interfere with my shooting and walking and collision and everything else. So this is going to be a really important update right here. We'll say enemies. E -N -E -N, uh, enemies dot length. So that's really important to put that in. If we're updating it there, I'm going to update it here as well. Oh, not here. We make 10, but then this 10, so on the loop. There we go. That now means if I'd say I want 20 enemies, 30 enemies, two enemies, because if I said it's 10 down there and there's only two, I'm going to get an error. So that's why it's really important. Now I am going to lower this amount because otherwise it, there's a lot of enemies on screen and it gets really crowded really fast. So we'll just knock that down to five. The rest of our code works. So then we're in pretty good shape. So if we run it, let's see. Hey, look at that. All right. Now, if you notice, I hit space. Well, you can't. Well, you can see on the key. I hit, and it tells you it was key 32. But nothing is happening. And we have to remember. Well, I fired a projectile. I have yet to tell any of my projectiles to display on screen. So this is where we'll loop through. I is less than projectiles at length. I plus plus curly, close curly, up arrow, and projectiles i dot update and then we can also tell our projectile to display so this way we can tell our projectile to update and display let's run this and see what we get and wow hey look at that so we got a few uh, issues going on here that they're only going down and once they fire. So let's uh, hit play once more, start over from the beginning. There, now they're chasing me. Now if I hit space, and we can see that they're still firing. So let, let's take a look here in the enemy code. So once they reset, they're given speed, they're given stuff, but nothing is happening to them on the reset here except for going back to their starting position. But we never killed their speed and we never said they're no longer in motion. So VX needs to be killed, by needs to be killed, and in motion needs to be set back to false. So let's try that again. Okay. And now if you notice I hit space, but really, really tap it quick makes just one fire. If I linger on the spacebar even just for a fraction it's firing them all. So we need to find a way to delay that so it doesn't make them all fire at the same time. Now I mean if we want to have some fun with it of course what we can do and let's go back into our main class up here and instead of uh, having five, let's have 50 projectiles here on screen. So there we get the projectiles. And let's run it. So now, yeah, we can see 
got kind of a fire hose action going on here. But, you know, it, it's not ideal yet. So we still have a little bit of work. And we have to figure out how to make our projectiles hit the enemies. But we're firing. It's moving in the direction we want. We're in pretty good shape. Well, they're shooting a little bit out of control. I think it's time for us to rein it in and control the time delay on the firing of the projectiles. Now, one way we can do that is to bring back our timer class. So in the catcher project, we used the timer as a way to control the falling of the drops so they didn't all immediately start dropping at one time. So I'm going to go back into that project and just copy my timer class so I have it there to work with. And the key things we have to remember is we pass in how much time we want it to run for and then we check to find out when it is done. So I've copied that and can get rid of it now because I don't need to reference it anymore. And inside my project I will create a new tab. All the time. Now you could also just drag a copy of the file into the project folder and it would show up on your list of tabs here without you having to do anything else. So that's another way that you could get it into the project. So now we're going to put the timer into the project so that we can work with it. So to add in the timer, we just need to create that timer object. So it's timer, and this will be my firing timer. I'm giving it a specific name because that way if I add a countdown time or anything else, I can set it up with a new name, work with it that way. And I know that then my timer is going to, that timer, firing timer, is going to be a new timer object. and. We can start out and figure out, I'm going to say, let's say every half second I can fire. It also guarantees I don't need 50 projectiles. I'm just going to narrow it down to 5 so we can better see how everything's working. Because when we start doing the collisions between the projectiles and the enemies, it'll be nice to have smaller numbers so we can understand a little bit more of how that's working. And then we just, nope, not equals, firing timer, we can just tell it to start. And that's okay, because now inside our main draw function, this is where we're going to work with it. So when I press space, I don't want to immediately fire. I want to find out if firing timer is complete. So I do a check on the firing timer, and if the firing timer is complete, and only then do we... Uh, so we'll cut that, I'm going to move it up to here. So only then do we fire. Now at this point, I'm just putting in some ends here because things do get messy. So let's put that in. So only if the firing timer is complete. Now let's try and run the game. And wait, still no difference. Let's figure out what's going on. Oh, well, when we used the timer before, when the timer was complete, we did what we wanted to do. And then we would tell the timer to start over. So we have to remember. So now, let me get away from those guys so we can see. Now we can also, now that we've slowed things down a little bit, notice how I'm holding down space continually and it's changing, you know, it's not a fire hose anymore. Now, if we want to speed that up so it's even faster, let's try say something like 200. And let's move away from all the baddies. We can see now that's a little bit faster. You can see how those five as I shoot are being replaced. When they hit the edge of the screen, then they reset themselves. 
and then show back up on screen for us. If I just shoot one, it's easier to see. Otherwise, if I shoot a lot, it suddenly becomes hard to find out. It almost looks like they're uh, kind of going backwards at times with it. So now we're able to fire, and we can fire downward. But I will notice that where it's firing from, it seems it's the top of the square because it's using the X and Y of my object. So what I would like to do is make it shoot more like it's coming out of his eye. So it's almost like eye lasers that he's shooting. Well, we can do that by modifying where we put it. So when I put it here, we could try and get it perhaps a little bit closer to the middle of the sprite as our starting value. So we can take our X and add in half of the width of the player. Boy, this looks familiar. It's just like our intersect code. And we use half of that. So now let's try. And now it's coming more. Now you might need to modify this based on or project. So it's coming out of the middle. Now if we set it at a faster speed, it goes even faster when it jumps, but it's definitely better than coming out of the top corner. So we've been able to add in the timer. The timer is running. The timer is forcing them to uh, delay their firing so we don't have any fire hose effects.